All right, now we're going to talk about endocrine. So remember with the first thing you want to do with a th new thyroid nodule is TSH and ultrasound. So TSH helps determine whether the nodule is hyperthyroid or euthyroid. Hyperthyroid nodules are usually not malignant, whereas euthyroid nodules are, tend to be. Well, most malignant nodules are euthyroid. The ultrasound ha gives you visual information information, whether it's cystic, if it's multi-loculated, which is, could be a sign of cancer, or the size, whether it's greater than a centimeter or less than a centimeter. So it's important to know the diagnostic algorithm. So basically, if the person is has a hyperthyroid nodule, the next best step is radioactive iodine uptake. And this will help tell whether it's diffuse or one nodule or multi-nodular. So if it's diffuse, that's Graves' disease. If it's one area, then that's toxic adenoma, just one area. If it's patchy and multiple, then that's a multi-nodular toxic goiter, which is also known as plumber disease. If they are euthyroid, then the next thing you wanna do is if they are, if it's greater than a centimeter, then you biopsy. If it's less than a centimeter, then you wait and follow up in a few weeks because less than a centimeter has a low likelihood of malignancy. So another thing too is sometimes a patient can be hyperthyroid with zero radioactive iodine uptake. What's happening there? So basically radioactive iodine uptake is an indicator of how much thyroid hormone is actually being made. It's like a thyroid factory. So if there's uptake, you know that that thyroid gland is taking up the iodine and making more. Sometimes it, you can be hyperthyroid and have no uptake. So what does that mean? No uptake means not actively making thyroid and basically think of like a bursted gland or an inflamed gland. So classic examples of hyperthyroid with no uptake would be like a postpartum thyroiditis or de Corvain disease, which is also known as subacute thyroiditis, or you can think of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which can have a hyperthyroid phase. So what that means is that they're, they're not actively making thyroid, but the thyroid gland is leaking out preformed thyroid. So it's basically like a like a dam that has broken open. And so all that preformed thyroid hormone is out in the circulation, but that factory is broken. They're, they're not making any more new thyroid. So when you see someone who's hyperthyroid with no uptake, think of the diseases that cause inflammation of the thyroid that would cause it to leak out. So next is when you have extra estrogen, whether it's through medications or pregnancy, this increases the thyroid binding globulin. And because this increases, then it kind of attaches to all the thyroid hormone. And that the thyroid hormone under a healthy normal person will make more thyroid hormone to keep up with the new TBG being made. But people who are hypothyroid already can't make enough thyroid. So when they are pregnant or taking OCPs, the TBG will increase, but their thyroid won't be able to keep up with all that new TBG, which is binding up all the thyroid hormone. So then they, they become even more thyroid deficient. So my point is that people who are pregnant or on OCPs who are hypothyroid need to increase their levothyroxine dosages to keep up with the increased TBG. So anyone who's pregnant or taking OCPs who is hypothyroid needs to take more levothyroxine than their usual dose. Hashimoto's is also known as chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis and this is uh, associated with other autoimmune diseases such as lupus or pernicious anemia or Shrogan's disease. Remember, as a general rule, anyone who has autoimmune disease is automatically more prone to getting other autoimmune diseases.
And the key higher yield thing I want you to know with Hashimoto's is that it's associated with thyroid lymphoma. So subacute de Quervain thyroiditis is, remember the key here is they're hyperthyroid, but out of all of the hyperthyroidisms, the buzzword here is painful. So a hyperthyroid patient with a painful thyroid who recently had an upper respiratory tract infection, this is subacute de Quervain thyroiditis. And remember, this is caused by leakage of excess thyroid hormone. So think back to when I was talking about radioactive uptake, this will have decreased uptake. And you treat this with NSAIDs or aspirin. And then the last is medullary thyroid cancer. Remember, this arises from the parafollicular C cells, which make calcitonin. Calcitonin helps bring calcium levels back down, whereas parathyroid hormone is made by the parathyroid gland, which helps increase calcium. So they're in different glands that oppose each other, so that can be confusing, so make sure you review your anatomy if that's fuzzy. But medullary thyroid cancer, I want you to remember that a lot of times when this is diagnosed, the treatment is surgery. But before you treat with surgery, you have to remember that medullary thyroid cancer is part of the MEN2A and MEN2B diseases. And remember, MEN2A is PPM, and MEN2B is PMM. So pheochromocytoma, par hyperparathyroidism, and medullary thyroid cancer. And MEN2B is pheochromocytoma, medullary thyroid cancer, and mucosal neuromas, or marfanoid habitus. And so as soon as you think of medullary thyroid cancer, you have to remember, oh, MEN2A, MEN2B. And because of that, the next best step is to assess for those other diseases. Why? The most important one you want to check for is pheochromocytoma. So if they say this person was diagnosed with medullary thyroid cancer, what's the best next step? A, thyroidectomy, B, urine, urine metanephrines, C, D, E, etc. The answer is urine metanephrines. Why? Because you gotta assess if they have pheochromocytoma. Why? Because if you don't and you do thyroid surgery, what if they have an episode of pheochromocytoma where they get a hypertensive emergency and just bleed out and die? So that's why it's really important to make sure that they don't have pheochromocytoma. So again, to diagnose pheochromocytoma, it's urine metanephrines. That's one of the classic board questions they ask with medullary thyroid cancer to see if you know what are the MEN2A and MEN2B diseases. And then on top of that, what kind of blood test would you order to be able to diagnose pheochromocytoma. So there's multiple layers to that, and that's why it's a classic board question. So acromegaly is caused by excess growth hormone in the pituitary, and remember that the first test, is it A, growth hormone, or B, IGF-1? The answer is IGF-1, which is released by the liver, which is stimulated by growth hormone. This is more reliable than growth hormone because the levels are consistently high in acromegaly versus growth hormone, which the levels can fluctuate. The first line treatment for SIADH is water restriction. So anyone you suspect with Cushing syndrome, remember there's a mnemonic BAM Cushingoid, buffalo hump, amenorrhea, moon crazy, ulcers, skin changes, hypertension, infection, necrosis of the femoral head, glaucoma, osteoporosis, immunosuppression, and diabetes. The first test is an overnight dexamethasone suppression test, a 24-hour cortisol level, or a late-night salivary cortisol level. For adrenal insufficiency, the first test will be urine cortisol or ACTH stimulation. If the ACTH stimulation test boosts up 
the cortisol levels, then you know that this is a secondary adrenal insufficiency caused by the pituitary gland. Whereas if it doesn't go up, then you know this is a primary adrenal insufficiency, which is an adrenal problem. And that's called Addison's disease. And Addison disease, the most common cause is autoimmune. So the next is if a patient has hypertension with hypernatremia and hypokalemia, then the first step you wanna do is a renin to aldosterone ratio. So why is that? Because you wanna determine if the cause of this hyperaldosteronism is adrenal problem or if it's due to an underperfusion of the kidneys problem, mainly, mainly renal artery stenosis or fibromuscular dysplasia. So if the aldosterone is high and the renin is low, then this suggests an adrenal problem, which is called Kahn syndrome. Whereas if the renin is high and then the aldosterone is high, this suggests a renal artery stenosis or fibromuscular dysplasia because stenosis of the renal artery will cause decreased perfusion to the JG cells and then the JG cells will increase renin. And remember the RAS system, renin will convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and then ACE angiotensin converting enzyme will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and then angiotensin 2 goes all the way to the adrenal cortex remember there's three layers the zona glomerulosa the zona fasciculares and the zona reticularis and then salt sugar sex so aldosterone in the outermost layer uh, cortisol in the middle layer and sex hormones in the innermost layer. The medulla underneath that is where catecholamines are released. That's where pheochromocytoma happens. But the angiotensin 2 will go to zona glomerulosa and then increase the synthesis of aldosterone. Aldosterone will then go all the way to the principal cells. The principal cells, remember aldosterone is a steroid hormone. So steroid hormones work intracellularly. It'll go inside the cell and bind the aldosterone mineral corticoid receptors. And this will increase transcription and translation of the ENAC channel. And then that will help draw in sodium and the potassium channel will excrete potassium. And that with drink, bringing in sodium, water will follow. So this person will have hypernatremia, hypokalemia, and with the increased water will lead to hypertension. So that's why with people with hypertension, hypernatremia, and hypokalemia, the first thing you wanna do is a renin to aldosterone ratio to help narrow your differential. Remember, the classic patient with renal artery stenosis is an older person with a history of hypertension that's been well controlled, and now all of a sudden, they've, they've been adherent to their medications. Now all of a sudden, their blood pressure is out of control and multiple medications aren't helping, and it's being refractory to treatment. You should think of renal artery stenosis. In addition to that, on abdominal auscultation, there will be a murmur over the renal artery. Whereas fibromuscular dysplasia, the, the stereotypical classic patient will be a young female who has a brewery over the renal arteries with unexplained hypertension, with like I said again, hypernatremia, hypokalemia. And also, in fibromuscular dysplasia, it's associated with a subauricular bruit, a bruit by the ears. So diabetes mellitus is diagnosed three ways. Either two fasting readings of greater than 126, random glucose level of 200 with symptoms such as polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria, dehydration, weight loss, or a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 plus. Remember metformin, is uh, contraindicated in CHF and kidney failure because it can exacerbate lactic acidosis. Metformin is contraindicated when creatinine levels are greater than 1.5.
Sometimes they like to ask you what are the effects of metformin and the three big ones are it enhances insulin sensitivity, it blocks gluconeogenesis, and it decreases GI absorption. Metformin is also the first line treatment of type 2 diabetes. The most common cause of death in a diabetic patient is myocardial infarction due to accelerated atherosclerosis. It's also, on a side note, the most common cause of death in rheumatoid arthritis is also myocardial infarction due to the same mechanism. So you should know the difference between hyperglycemic, hyperosmotic state versus DKA. And the main kicker is the pH. So a person with DKA will have anion gap metabolic acidosis, whereas the person with HHS won't. And the glucose levels are very different too. A person with HHS will have glucose levels of near 1000, whereas a person with DKA has glucose levels of around three to 500. So those are the two main differences. And then remember, DKA, you're gonna have anion gap metabolic acidosis, right? So a pH of less than 7.35, right? And then the anion gap will be sodium minus chloride minus bicarb, which will be greater than, uh, the sources always change. Sometimes it's eight to 12, sometimes it's eight to 16. I use eight to 16. Anything greater than 16 is an anion gap metabolic acidosis. This person usually has a, is a type one diabetic who's not making any insulin. They'll have abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and they'll have respiratory alkalosis to compensate for the metabolic acidosis. This is called Kuzmal's breathing deep tachypnea with giant tidal volumes. You wanna treat this with continuous insulin and IV fluids, and you would give potassium if the potassium levels drop below 5.2, because sometimes they show hyperkalemia, but their whole body is actually potassium deficient because of due to the hydrogen potassium exchanger. So remember, if you're acidotic, the hydrogen out in the uh, blood will want to go into the cells and this will exchange with potassium and if this keeps happening the intracellular stores of potassium are depleted but the vascular stores of potassium are increased so you want to monitor the potassium and the question here is when do you stop giving insulin and that's when the anion gap has closed whereas HHS is treated with IV fluids and insulin as well and then last is Zollinger-Ellison, which is gastrin tumor. You'll see multiple duodenal ulcers with diarrhea, and you diagnose that with gastrin levels, and uh, the gastrin levels will be over a thousand. And then the next thing you'll do is a secretin challenge, and secretin usually lowers gastrin levels, but it doesn't lower the gastrin levels in this case, and this is a diagnosis of Zollinger-Ellison, and treatment is proton pump inhibitor or surgery. And last is glucagonoma, and the key here is hyperglycemia plus a classic rash called necrotizing migratory erythema. If you see this rash, it's a glucagonoma. And then speaking of glucagon, if someone has beta blocker overdose, What's the antidote? It's glucagon. And that is endocrine.